This is a model of a telescope. It's called the Herschel Telescope, and it's very interesting. Now, the Herschel Telescope is going to be sent into space. It's not an ordinary telescope. You can't look through it. This is designed to study infrared radiations. Now, we can't see infrared. We can feel it. Turn on an electric fire, and you'll feel the infrared in the form of heat long before the bowels start to glow. So this is a very interesting instrument indeed. It's being assembled in Holland, and Chris Lintoff went there to see it. It's 2008, and I've travelled to Eztek in Holland. This is where most of the European Space Agency's satellites are assembled, and I've been invited to meet Herschel, ESA's new telescope. Its mission? To scan the sky in the infrared. This amazing mirror made of silicon is three and a half meters across. It's bigger than the one on the Hubble Space Telescope. In fact, it will be the largest astronomical mirror ever to fly in space. The infrared light will come in, hit the main mirror and be focused up onto the secondary. Then it will bounce back down through the hole onto the instruments, which will be cooled to just a few degrees above absolute zero. The project manager is Thomas Passvogel. It's taken him 24 years to see Herschel through from its conception to design, assembly, and then finally its testing to get it ready for space. What you see is the telescope. It's three and a half meters, and you see it has actually not a tripod as normally, but a hexapod. Yeah. What makes sure. it a bit special. The main reason is that you have this big structure there holding the secondary mirror in place, and you have it very light around the secondary mirror just to avoid that you get back reflection onto the telescope. And on the side, you see it's protected by the solar array. On the upper side, it's just mirrors on the outside. So just to keep, keep it cool, basically. It, to keep it cold. I mean, it, it's re really cold. The outside there, although seeing the sun, is already at minus 100 degrees C. And the inside is then very, very cold because telescope at the end is at minus 200 degrees C. So it's very, very cold. And everything is there, and it's protected from the sun because the sun is always on the other side. And this mirror is very special. It's we've already said it's the largest. That's it's flown in the space. largest ever built space telescope. I mean, it's and it's monolithic. It's monolithic. It's one big piece. Our eyes are sensitive to only a tiny portion of the light we receive from space. Dusty regions may look pretty, but they still hide whatever's going on inside. By switching to the infrared, we can see right through the dust like in these images from Spitzer, NASA's infrared satellite. This is an infrared image of our galaxy, and what you can see is the glow from countless stellar nurseries. Here's one of them, the Orion Nebula, as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. Switch to the infrared, and the Spitzer spacecraft can see through the dust and clouds to pick up the signatures of star formation. Herschel is exploring a new frontier, it's the first spacecraft to look in detail at the long wavelengths of the far infrared. It also flies with unique instruments at its heart, to look at the first stars and galaxies formed just after the Big Bang. Whenever astronomers open up new wavelength windows, surprises are guaranteed. What's been the biggest or the hardest thing to, to get past so far? Was it creating the mirror? I think it, it's a number of things, but one sh surely is getting the instruments ready. Mm -hmm. I mean, these instruments contain all elements that have never been built before, and it could, took quite some time to get that done, to build it, to prepare it, and get it ready. This is one of the major and, things you normally have to do. And that's why this wavelength range hasn't been explored before, because that, those, it's, that's difficult. One is difficult to do that, because we have new detectors on board. The other thing, it, I think it's the first time we build a telescope that size. Mm -hmm. Since we filmed here at Eztek in Holland, the spacecraft has completed all its tests and been shipped to its launch site in Karoo, French Guiana. Hitching a ride alongside Herschel will be an equally exciting but very different mission called Planck. It's due to study the cosmic microwave background. It will be tremendous to have both of these satellites off the launch pad and up into space, providing astronomers with new eyes looking for the unknown. And I'm joined now by two people very deeply concerned with us, Professor Matt Griffin and Dr. Seb Oliver. Welcome to the sky at night. Thank you. Hi. May I come to you first, Matt? What's your special involvement in it? 
Well, I've been involved uh, together with a, a large team from the UK and several other countries in building one of the instruments. It's called Spire. It's one of the three instruments inside the cryostat. And uh, Spire contains uh, a camera to take pictures and a spectrometer to analyse the, the light. Let's discuss now the real importance of infrared astronomy. Infrared astronomy is important because it allows you to look at cool emission from uh, stars, very, very hot, so the light that you see from stars comes out at optical wavelengths. If we want to look at cooler things in the universe, then we have to look at longer wavelengths. We have to look into the infrared. And then what will that tell you? Well, it'll tell us a lot of things. It'll tell us about um, star formation. Uh, it'll tell us about star formation in the local universe, in our own galaxy. Uh, and it will tell us about star formation in the distant universe. And it'll also tell us about cool objects in, uh, in the solar system uh, and in our local neighbourhood. I think it will help if you demonstrate just why infrared is so important to astronomers. Well, it just so happens we've brought along an infrared camera with us. Um, and this, this camera um, picks up uh, heat um, so if we look at your face, uh, we can see the hot parts where your skin uh, is emitting warm radiation, which is infrared radiation. Your nose is slightly colder uh, because that's at a slightly l lower temperature. Like a dog, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and interestingly, you can see your monocle there, which is, which is black, and that's because the glass is actually blocking out the, the infrared light. Um, so infrared light is basically measuring temperatures uh, but it's measuring relatively cool temperatures, so you can see this is between 23 and 36 degrees C. Um, Herschel will be able to observe much cooler temperatures than that. Uh, and this is important for astronomy um, because much of the uh, astrophysical processes that we are interested in studying are occurring at much colder temperatures. We can illustrate this uh, in, in an amusing way. If we look at this black bin bag over here, you can see nothing particularly special about it. But if we look at it uh, in infrared light, uh, then we can see that something very interesting is going on in there. And of course, astronomers would be interested to see what, what that is. And of course, we can reveal what's happening. And there are two cups there, one with cold water in and one with hot water in. And so that's uh, basically the kind of thing that we're going to be trying to do with the infrared telescope, is look through obscuring material. In the astrophysical case, that uh, bin bag will be dust, and that dust will be obscuring what's going on underneath which could be star formation, and so Herschel will be able to see through to the hidden star formation in our own galaxy and in the distant parts of the universe. Seb, Matt, thank you very much. Now, why is the telescope called Herschel? That's in honour of William Herschel, the great astronomer who, way back in 1781, discovered the planet Uranus. But more or less back then, he also showed that infrared radiation comes from the sky. And did that maybe with a rather simple experiment. Now, out of my garden, Chris Lintot and Dr. Alan Chapman are going to reconstruct that experiment. So this is the experiment with which Herschel discovered the infrared. What, what have we got set up? It's a spectacular piece of ingenuity. We have three thermometers, each with a blackened bulb. You have a prism over there sending a thin shaft of light through the prism and onto the wall here. To produce this rainbow. Which produces lovely rainbow effect. And each of these thermometers are going to the blue end, the middle sort of greeny end, and here, of course, outside the red. And up here, we have a control thermometer. Brilliant concept of a control, you see. So you have the ambient temperature of the room, and then you're taking the spectral light. Now, the purpose of this was his discovery that there is something beyond the red which actually gives more heat than what the red gives. And how he comes to it is brilliant. And it has nothing to do with physics at all. It's part of the sheer lateral thinking of a scientist genius. He's experimenting 1798-1799 with trying to study the nature of sunspots. And, of course, he believed that there were depressions in the solar surface. Mm -hmm. The only way to see that properly is when the spots are directly on the limb. Are they indented? You need very high magnification. Not many modern astronomers want to look at the sun with an It's a terrible idea. Mirror. It's very yeah. dangerous. Dangerous! Set your wig on fire, all sorts of things. <laughs> really knows and what he's trying to do is find appropriate filters. Well, he experiments with various species of dense glass, blues and greens and yellows and so on. 
and he found that they all work to some degree, but when he puts the dense red filter to his eye, it's suddenly so much hotter than the others. Now, this, of course, anybody else might have forgotten that. Oh, well, it's not a very convenient but filter. In his head, therefore, he had the idea that red light is associated with heat. Red light with heat. And what he therefore does is devise this experiment. This is a laboratory experiment, one of the first occasions when astronomical phenomenon has been modelled in the chemical laboratory. And he does this in a drawing room at his house in Slough. He has the three thermometers, the prism, the control, and he finds, of course, that the blue end is the coolest, it then warms, red is warm, it then gets hotter in the dark, what he in fact called black light. It was clearly something there, but you couldn't see it, and then drops suddenly. Now, this was published, and the experiment was on the 11th of February, 1800, published very quickly after. So it's fitting, then, that this wonderful space telescope is going to be named after him. He would be deeply proud of the idea that this fundamental piece of research equipment is named after him, and that was a wonderful experiment done quite casually on the side in Slough 209 years ago. That was the great Herschel experiment. Cast your mind back now to last month. Something very interesting happened. Four satellites of Saturn were in transit across the planet at the same time, something I'd never seen before, and we hoped to have a good view. So here's Pete Lawrence in my dome, getting the telescope ready for the great event. I'm in here with Patrick's 15-inch telescope, and tonight I'm hoping to get a view of the planet Saturn. Now, what's different tonight, apart from any other night, is the fact that four of Saturn's moons are going to move across the planet's disk. These are going to be quite difficult to see, but behind them they drag their shadows, and those are the things I shall hopefully be looking for. Now, this is actually quite unprecedented. I can't remember the last time this occurred. I know that back in the mid-90s, the Hubble Space Telescope took a fantastic picture of three of the moons crossing the planet's disk. But tonight, we've got four. Now, Saturn at the moment is actually edge on to us, so we see its rings as a flat plane. In fact, Patrick has some rather wonderful sketches taken back in 1995, 1996, and some more there from 1966, which show exactly that. Now, tonight, I know that the moons, four of the moons, are going to be moving across the planet's disk, and I'm hoping that through this telescope, I'm going to get a chance to see them. Well, um, while Pete readies my 15-inch telescope, all we have to do is to wait and hope the weather's going to be kind to us. Well, it's early evening now and completely dark. And nothing will happen for several hours yet, and at the moment, I'm afraid it's cloudy. We are just hoping for those clouds to clear. So, what is going to happen? Chances of Saturn's moons and its shadows across the disk. And, um, Pete has a very nice model here to see what's going to happen. Uh, I may say this model is not to scale. It certainly isn't, Patrick, no. Right then. But what's going to happen tonight is the, the moons are going to move in front of the disk of Saturn. Now, we've got a, an inflatable model of Saturn here, yes. and I've got a ping-pong ball on a cocktail stick to represent one of the moons. Now, the reason why now is actually special, Patrick, apart from at any other time, is because the ring tilt of Saturn is almost edge on to us. Normally, if the, if the planet is tilted up like this, the moons are actually moving in the same plane as the rings. And what happens is, as they go round, they either go above the planet or they will go below the planet in their orbit. But when Saturn tilts so that it is edge on to us, of course, the moons are then level with us as well. And that's why we get to see this amazing effect when they move in front of the globe and we see the shadow following them across. So the shadow of Dione first should look quite dark and easy to spot. Also, Dione is uh, over 500 miles across. It is. But then... But then we have the difficult one. This is the tricky one. Only about 300 miles across, the active satellite. Because just before one o'clock we have Enceladus moving across. Now Enceladus is much smaller than Dione, so its shadow is consequently much smaller as well. Then about uh, 10 minutes after that, we have another big moon again following on. That's Tethys. Now Tethys again will move in front of the globe and we should be able to pick up its shadow. And then finally, Rhea. Rhea is the large one. So Rhea has the largest shadow and that should be the easiest one to see. Nearly a thousand miles across. Nearly a thousand miles across. And of course, at that point, we will then have four satellites and four shadows in front of the globe of Saturn. And that's quite fantastic. Whether that's ever been seen, I'm not sure. It certainly hasn't been photographed. So if we manage to get a picture, that will be a real triumph. That'll be superb. But of course, it depends on the clouds. 
please, clouds, go away. Let's hope <laughs> silty weather won't let us down. Absolutely. Now, we've got a couple of hours or so before this amazing quadruple transit, clouds permitting, of course. So this is a good time to remind ourselves how to actually find Saturn in the night sky. To do this, we use one of our old friends, the plough, or as I prefer to call it, the saucepan. Now, this is quite high up in the northeast at this particular time of the year. But if you locate the saucepan, locate the pan, the four stars that make the pan, and identify the two which are closest to the handle. Now, if you extend them down towards the horizon, the line they make down towards the horizon, you eventually come to a fairly brightish star, which is known as Regulus, and that's the brightest star in the constellation of Leo the Lion. You know whether you've got Regulus correct, because above it there is a sort of backward question mark of stars, which is known as the sickle. Now, once you've identified Regulus, Saturn is pretty easy from there, because it's basically the bright yellow object across to the left and down a bit. Once you've located that, that is Saturn in the night sky. A full moon transit is very rare. I've never seen one, so tonight is very special for me. However, from the other side of the world, astronomers were able to see a full moon transit back in February. Australia got a nice view. And so did the Hubble Space Telescope. In this stunning picture, we see four moons. Titan, looking very orange, and the white icy moons, Enceladus, Dione, and Mimus. Well, we are well into the night, and I'm sad to say the clouds are taunting us. But it does give me a chance to catch up with some of the astronomers who've set up in Patrick's garden. Wow, Steve, what's that you got on there? Um, it's just uh, Saturn. I'm trying to focus it, you know, at the moment. Well, you've done very well there because with all the clouds we've had tonight, <laughs> that is absolutely good. amazing. What scope are you using? Uh, 11 inch. 11 inch, yes. right, okay. Classic rain, yeah. Perfect for planetary imaging, yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. That is really quite good, you know. Do, have you seen the moons which are going to transit? I did see the moons before when it, was, it had it a bit um, overexposed, and you could see the moons here. Yeah, as they were ready to come across. Right, OK. But I've uh, tried to get a bit, bit more focus on it and I've dulled it down a bit and they've disappeared. Well, Dave, it's one o'clock in the morning and the weather hasn't been very kind to us, but you've got your own private right. transit, quadruple transit going on here. Explain to me what's going on. We can cheat using the software and here we can have a simulation of what should be happening. This is Saturn as it should be now. Right. We could move the clouds out of the way. OK. As the night progresses, We'll see Dione is already on the disk. The shadow is following, followed by the other satellites. Now that's really good because it shows that the, the, the shadow of Enceladus is actually much harder to see than the other that's satellites. Right. Later on, the, the last satellite, Rhea, comes on. The shadow is much darker. That's incredible, isn't it? That's good. Looks like an inky full stop. And at this time here, what time is this? We're talking uh, three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning, you know, you've got all four satellites we've, on. We've the got disk. a couple of hours to go, yes. Okay. It's approaching 3 a.m. and we've been hoping for a break in the weather all night to glimpse this great occasion. Well, for once in a way, I'm afraid the Celsi weather has not been kind. Didn't see a thing, Pete, did we? Not a thing all night, Patrick. Solid cloud. I'm a little bit upset, actually, because I thought you were doing an incantation for us. <laughs> this time it hasn't worked and it's infuriating. Up there is Saturn and four satellites and four satellite shadows in front of the disk and we can't see it. No, it's a great shame, really. It really is. Nothing we can do about it, and there won't be another chance. Never mind, you can't win them all. Don't forget, it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your stamp address to envelope to Newsletter 113, The Sky at Night, BBC Birmingham, the mailbox, Birmingham, B11AY. Well, I'll be